Welcome everyone to the eighth session of the Transatlantic event, event Series Road to Election Night and Beyond. My name is Berit Ebert and I'm Vice President of Programs here at the American Academy in Berlin, where you see me sitting in the library. And I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's panel discussion, Migration, Flight and U.S. Immigration Policy under President Biden. This event series is jointly organized and hosted by several transatlantic institutions and political foundations. I would like to extend our special and deepest gratitude to the Aspen Institute and Rudiger Lenz uh, and his wonderful team uh, for initiating this collaboration and for being such wonderful partners. As many of you know, um, we focused on various themes leading up to the election. And now that Biden has been declared the winner, we will continue to analyze specific policy areas that the new administration will be confronted with from, from day one after taking office. With respect to US immigration policy, um, US President-elect Joe Biden will inherit an immigration system that has been dramatically transformed by the Trump administration. In tonight's panel discussion, we will discuss what a post-Trump immigration policy might look like and what challenges the Biden administration will face in the coming years. This evening's outstanding group of experts, who you all already see, um, from the field of migration and immigration policy, um, hardly need any introduction. I will nevertheless make an attempt, and I apologize already in advance for omitted, omitting anything important, but my team has requested me to be brief, and I, of course, obey their orders. Um, I shall start with Eric Schwartz. Eric is the president of Refugees International and looks back at a three-decade three decade career focused on humanitar humanitarian and human rights. Um, just before Eric joined Refugees International, he served a six-year term as the Dean of the Hubert Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. And between 2009 and 2011, he was the US Assistant Secretary of State for Population, Refugees and Migration. During his tenure, he strengthened the State Department's humanitarian advocacy around the world and raised pro the profile of global migration issues of US, US foreign policy. Eric also served as UN Secretary General Kofi Annan's Deputy Secret Special Envoy for Tsunami Recovery after the 2004 tsunami in, the so in Southeast Asia, as well as the Washington Director of Asia Watch, which is now the Asia Division of Human Rights Watch. Um, I understand that Eric has never been uh, at the American Academy in Berlin, but um, he has a special connection to the Academy via our president, Daniel Benjamin. And it goes without saying, Eric, that um, I talked to, um, to Alex before about that. The minute uh, you are allowed to travel, you have to be here. Um, there is no way out now. Um, <laughs> speaking about who had been at the American Academy, um, I shall introduce the second panelist, um, Alex Leinikov. Alex uh, has been university professor and director of the Zollberg Institute on Migration and Mobility at the New School in New York since 2017. Before coming to the New School, Alex served as the United Nations Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees and was a professor at Georgetown University Law Center, where he also served as Dean and Executive Vice President. He was a co-chair of the Immigration Task Force for President Barack Obama's transition team in 2008 and a co-author of leading legal case books on immigration law and forced migration. Alex has written widely in the area of immigration and refugee law and policy, transnational law, citizenship, race, and constitutional law. His latest book, The Arc of Protection, Reforming the International Refugee Regime, was published in the fall of 2019. Alex, as I said before, had been at the American Academy and he was a participant um, at the Academy's Andrew W. Mellon workshop entitled Displacement Migration and the Implications for Public Policy, which was chaired by Roberto Suro in January this year. This is just the perfect segue to the final panelist of this evening, Roberto. Um, Roberto is a professor of journalism and public policy at the University of Southern California. And as I said before, he was the Andrew Mellon Fellow at the American Academy last fall. And I'm especially happy to see uh, among the audience so many participants um, that have been here with you at the Academy, Roberto, and who are joining us tonight. Um, so we're eager um, to see many of your questions. Um, Roberto was also founding director of the Pew Hispanic Center and served on the management committee that launched the Pew Research Center in 2004. He worked 
and that's very impressive. Roberto worked for pretty every existing newspaper that you might know. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I, I name the Chicago Sun-Times, the Chicago Tribune, Time, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. Um, Roberto's books include Writing Immigration, Scholars and Journalists in Dialogue, published in 2011, which he co-edited, and Strangers Among Us, Latino Lives in a Changing America. There are a lot of wonderful things that I could say about Roberto, but I would like to focus on two more that actually go beyond his focus of um, immigration and migration. Um, we were all impressed uh, when he was here at the Academy by the speed with which he picked up German proverbs and constantly shared them with the world and by his incredible passion for the opera. As uh, the opera is only also only possible online, uh, this brings me to my last task before we started this, uh, the discussion, and this is um, explaining to all of you the Zoom etiquette of tonight. Um, the four of us will discuss for about 30 minutes. Um, we will then um, be opening the discussion for the whole audience for a Q&A with everybody. Um, do feel free um, to send or to send us any questions already while we're talking. Um, you can use the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. We will then try to take as many questions as we can. And I apologize beforehand if, I, if I'm not able um, to convey all of the questions since uh, the participation rate is quite high today. I don't think that we will cover everything. Um, this brings me, well, first of all, Welcome, <laughs> Alex, Eric, and Roberto. And um, this brings me to my uh, first question. Um, Joe Biden stated very recently um, that the United States uh, deserves, and I quote, an immigration policy that reflects our highest values of the nation. This is the end of the quote. Before we go into the specific details about what the Biden administration has in mind, um, and since many of us are also um, watching this from the European side, Let's briefly speak about the broader terms. Um, immigration has been at the formation of the, Ameri uh, of the Americas and the United States would be nothing without immigration. Um, my question to you is, what is the US immigration policy about? What is the rhetoric? What, what are we talking about here in general terms? Well, <clears throat> I think one place uh, to start is uh, to sort of banish the idea that there is one set of values or one narrative or one idea of the United States as a nation of immigrants. Um, and to understand that uh, immigration and its meaning to the country, both as a national identity and as a democracy um, has been evolving from the time of the colonial settlers to the present and it has been disputed throughout that history. It, it's, it's a subject uh, not chiseled in stone, uh, but that is remade uh, in every age and sometimes with every election. As we're seeing now, the country is pivoting between two extremely different views of immigration on the basis of an election. So it's not like, as much as politicians um, like to evoke the idea of set values and national norms, <clears throat> immigration, its meaning, its value, how it's managed, what kinds of immigrants are considered worthy and which kinds are not, um, are matters that are invented and reinvented and highly disputed at every age and always have been in a country that has sometimes opened its doors and has sometimes closed them. Um, and it's gone back and forth from opening and closure during different times. So the question is how do you, what is the value of immigration today in this America? What can people agree on um, in order to move a policy forward? Um, how does this country today benefit from or um, face challenges uh, with immigration? And, and that's a very dynamic question because the nature of immigration is changing and the country is changing politically at the same time. I, I want to ex expand the question a bit. So if you're talking about what a democratic administration would say about immigration, they'll talk about the immigration story as US as a nation of immigrants, 
and it's a story of welcome, which is just as Roberto said, has had some unfortunate moments in the past where welcome has been not as freely given as people think it, it should be. Um, I think the right way though to think about America, not just immigration, is to talk about the people who have peopled America, who've constituted the United States. And that story is broader than immigration. So very, in, in your question, you know, America would be nothing without immigration. Well, in fact, America would be something without immigration because there were thousands, tens of thousands of people in the United States before the Europeans arrived and 90% of them uh, were, were killed uh, either by disease or by, by war. So there was a there there before immigration started. And the other part of the immigration story, uh, important part, is the forced migration uh, of hundreds of thousands of slaves to the United States. So there's a tendency in our you know, most expansive moments to talk about the you know, US as a nation of immigrants. But if you expand it to the peopling of America, it's a much more interesting and complicated story. It's not one I expect the Biden administration to, uh, to talk about. It's a little too complicated, but there is emerging here of stories in a funny way of, of the Black Lives Matter uh, movement uh, with a more expansive understanding of who the people of America are. Um, I would only, I won't, uh, I'm gonna pick up on without, uh, I agree with what Alex is saying, but I'm gonna you know, pick up on Roberto's comment because I think Roberto was talking about the national narrative and um, and, and, and that national narrative is highly contested. Um, but I think there's the narrative and uh, getting uh, maybe a little bit to what Alex is talking about, then there's the reality. And in, in many respects, the reality is that the United States you know, uh, is a nation of immigrants. Um, in, in 2018, according to uh, um, the Pew Research Center, something like uh, 44, 45 million Americans uh, were immigrants, um, and um, and the percentage of, of immigrants in the overall population, you know, uh, over a thirty year period, had you know had increased by a factor of three. And so, where um, you know I, I, the reality, you know, there 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 is there there is the narrative, and then there's the reality, and um, and, um, and 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 the reality is we have a very you know, large uh, population of people who recently, um, you know, were were not in the United States. Speaking of which, um, this brings me to the first question. Um, thank you to uh, to Roberto. Um, people who were not in the United States, also um, how <laughs> and. Um, Perhaps focusing on a on a special group. Um, there are reports of increased activity on the border, of a potential exodus um, from the ports of Central America, hardest hit by the hardest hit by the recent hurricanes. Um, Roberto, which is this, or what is the situation that uh, Joe Biden um, will inherit? What are the immediate short-term challenges, and do you think that the short-term challenges um, could also develop into long-term challenges? I think. Um, as a starting point, uh, there's very good reason to assume that migration pressures, the, the, the pressures, the drivers that push people out in our neighborhood, close by the United States, close enough that people can walk or float here, um, are building substantially. So in Mexico, certainly, we know there has been uh, a tremendous increase um, in the poverty population, people who are working poor who have fallen into poverty in the last few months as a result of COVID. In Central America, you have that same phenomena um, and now hurricanes that have displaced hundreds of thousands of people um, just in recent weeks. And on top of that, you had we had ongoing migrations from Central America over the last five years that produced very significant surges. I mean, in 2019, uh, between the end of 2018 through most of 2019, almost 1% of the population of Guatemala moved. So we're talking about surge events, large, dynamic displacements of people that were occurring over the last five years in our neighborhood, just as they have been in, in Europe's neighborhood across the Mediterranean. 
Um, and there's every reason to assume that the factors that have produced those kinds of surge migrations, these rapid displacements, are building. Um, we have the long-term effect of climate change, the long-term effects of criminal violence compounding. So there's a very good chance, I believe, and it's still, you know, we're talking about the future, so who knows, but there's a good chance that this spring already, uh, the Biden administration will face a surge of people at the border, um, even while it's still, we're still operating under COVID restrictions. Um, and, and this could be quite problematic. Um, and will force, you know, in, in the, the great challenge that I'm sure we're going to talk about momentarily is, is how to deal with the legacy of the Trump administration um, and where to start. Well, if you're trying to do that in the midst of a crisis, it's that's much more complicated. And, and I think there's a very good reason to believe that the Biden administration is going to be trying to remake immigration policy in the midst of a crisis, um, which will which will be politically and practically quite difficult. Thank you, Roberto. You just um, you just uh, took the next question out of my mouth, and um, <laughs> which is for Alex. Um, that's thank you for the analysis. So, um, Alex. Um, where do you start? You were just uh, you were just recently quoted um, with a question that that ended with "Where do you start?" You you said in an article, um, "It's like a tornado passing through just wreckage everywhere. Policies that took years to put in place or ruins. Where do you start? So um, where do you start with what um, Roberto just presented to you?" <laughs> Well, uh, I, I want to agree with everything Roberto just said. Now, we'll put, maybe put to the side the Central American crisis, and, and, and Eric may have more to say about that um, in a moment. But on, on, on what the administration has said it will do day one or very early is, first of all, put the DACA program back in place, this program to help kids who were brought to the United States in undocumented status at a, at a young age that, that Trump had tried to end in the Supreme Court, put an end to his ending of it, but it still is an uncertain status and that'll be put back in place. Biden will end the so-called Muslim bans that he adopted very early in the administration of prohibiting immigration from uh, many, a number of Muslim majority countries. Um, I think there'll be a freezing in the wall, building of the wall. Uh, I think there'll be a freezing in removals from the United States for a period of time till new priorities can be set on who uh, should be removed. All of those could be done uh, fairly um, easily. The more difficult work will be on undoing regulations that were put in place because there are legal obstacles to undoing regulations. You have to go through a process. And, and by many counts, uh, the administration put in more than 400 policy changes. That was just re relentless in terms of its, uh, if it's, its migration agenda. And some of those regulations are quite important on asylum, on the kinds of immigrants who can come to the country and what kind of financial resources they need to have to get here and the like. And that's gonna take uh, more time. I think most important, I'll end with this, um, would be a speech by Biden early on, maybe two, maybe two speeches, one on refugees, one on migrants, but certainly one that lays out the agenda and says, look, whatever the values are, whether the narrative he wants to tell starts with that, uh, but then says, here are the things we're doing immediately, here are the things that are gonna take a little more time, and then here are the things we're gonna need legislation on, like a program to legalize the status of 10 million uh, long-term undocumented immigrants to shift around categories and things. And to let the country know there is a coherent pro-immigration agenda that can be rolled out uh, over time. Talking um, about the, the legal challenges, um, there there is, um, or we constantly hear about, some, about a certain backlog um, that immigration justices um, deal with. How would the Biden administration deal with that? And I also have another question with you uh, for you, Alex, because you um, you just mentioned the um, the travel ban. Um, I'm curious to know how the travel ban actually um, also has implications for the host societies. What happens in the country? Yeah, um, I'm not really on the host the host countries or the source countries. Do you mean the host? Sorry. <laughs> The travel ban that prohibits people coming into the U.S. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, the ban has been what it's done for the U.S. as a hosting state here is it separated families. 
it's primarily had an impact on families. Um, but I, I, one more thing on these bands, uh, uh, because I think Roberto's right in saying, it's not clear whether the COVID bans can be lifted immediately in the, in the middle of the pandemic. And they virtually stopped immigration in the United States. All this other stuff had big impacts, but COVID really said no, no one else is coming unless you've already got a green card. And on the Southwest border, it's meant that asylum seekers are just being pushed back with no procedures at all. And working that out, how you end COVID, deal with the crisis that's coming is gonna be very tricky. Um, Biden has proclaimed that the US is, is, is back and will work with allies and um, international organizations. Um, what does this mean for the topic of immigration and especially humanitarian uh, migration? Oh, I, I think the implications are, are pretty uh, uh, clear and straightforward. And, and in fact, you've given me a more of a softball question, an easier question than I think the one that Alex was wrestling with. Uh, we can, I can address some of those issues as well if you like. But no, I mean, I think what it means in terms of overseas humanitarian assistance, uh, which has a high degree of, of assistance for refugees and, uh, and, and, um, and other forced migrants, which traditionally had been about $9 billion a year from the civilian side, from the United States government. Every year of the Trump administration, the Trump administration came up and, and uh, recommended, uh, requested about 33% uh, cuts in those figures. The Congress pushed back uh, successfully, but you won't see that dynamic anymore. You'll see uh, the administration uh, uh, contributing or proposing traditional levels of US international humanitarian assistance. With respect to refugee admissions, that is the program of responsibility sharing in which um, governments of the world determine uh, uh, the number of individuals from countries of refuge, from countries of temporary refuge, whom they will resettle uh, in their countries. Um, so for example, a, Somalia, a Somalian in a Kenyan refugee camp would be resettled through these refugee admission programs. The uh, president-elect uh, Biden has committed uh, to a, 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 an annual figure of 125,000. He won't make that in 2021, but, but that number is achievable. And I think as a matter of policy, it, it, it's, it, it won't create the kind of challenges that some of the uh, managerial and operational and political challenges that we're going to find uh, on asylum issues at the border. But I think that greater degree of responsibility sharing in the refugee admissions program will send a very strong signal uh, to um, uh, international organizations and to other governments, which, as you may remember, in 2016, with the refugee summit at the UN, the Obama administration had persuaded other governments to do much more by way of providing refuge and resettlement uh, for uh, refugees. I also think you, know, you will see much greater degree, as, as Linda Thomas-Greenfield, um, President-elect Biden's nominee for UN ambassador said, you know, uh, multilateralism is back. And I, so I think you'll see a much greater degree of US engagement and support for multilateral organizations that deal with uh, international uh, refugee and humanitarian issues. And I also think there'll be a much greater uh, commitment uh, to um, uh, support uh, the normative development of international humanitarian and refugee law. Um, one example of that to me will be, I'm, I'm quite confident that the new administration will associate itself with two major uh, um, agreements uh, that um, the Trump administration stood aside from. That is the Global Compact on Refugees and the Global Con Compact on Migration. Um, I could go on, but I think you're going to see these changes, um, you know, pretty quickly. And in, in, in many respects, the outward looking changes that I've described are the ones that I think are going to be the most um, uh, easily achievable. Uh, as opposed to the changes in which the United States is essentially being asked and expected to practice at home what the new administration is preaching abroad, right? I think the challenges become a little bit more uh, um, formidable when you're dealing with issues of, um, of asylum, uh, of, of how to deal with the backlogs, of how to deal with the border. And I think, I think the policy challenges are, 
are significant, but I, but I think the political challenges are the ones that in many respects are gonna be even more substantial. And that's why Alex's comment about messaging, I think is so very important uh, because, because my experience in managing so-called crises is a crisis is often what people perceive it to be. Um, uh, Roberto and I were talking before this event about, you know, there was something like a dozen uh, 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 Chinese merchant vessels that showed up around 1993, 1994 uh, at various parts of the United States. The numbers in terms of the U.S. population and our annual uh, irregular immigration were minuscule, but, but because of the publicity surrounding them, it became a political crisis. And so I think the administration is going to have to manage the policy issues, and it's also going to have to manage the messaging and the political issues. Roberto, do you agree? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, um, and I, you know, the administration is going to deal with a, a lot of political issues in a, in a very sharply divided country, uh, a sharply divided Congress, um, and one of the great fissures in American politics now is over, over immigration. Uh, and so, um, you know, in the, the long agenda that Alex was describing and that Eric has added to, um, there, the big question for the Biden administration for, for everybody watching is, you know, where do you expend political capital and what part of the immigration system do you move first? Um, and, uh, and, and what choices will you have um, given the possibility of a crisis on the border um, and given the ongoing um, internal economic crisis in this country um, that, that you know, we know is gonna take a year, two, three years to sort out. Um, so where the political, I mean, the Biden administration is gonna have to make a very careful political decision about where to spend what is a limited amount of political capital across a whole range of issues and then within immigration which part of it um, do you you know is it a narrative of asylum of opening the border to people from our neighborhood is it more the international looking uh, types of issues that that Eric was just talking about um, is it uh, does, do you focus on the resident population of unauthorized migrants? So Biden has said, for example, repeatedly uh, that on the first day of his administration, he's gonna send Congress a bill to legalize all 11 million uh, of unauthorized migrants. In practical terms, that proposition would swallow up all the oxygen available uh, for major immigration measures um, for potentially two years. Um, that, that's a very big, big ask uh, that when it's come up before leads to, you know, the logic in the past has always been that if you attempt legalization, you have to look at the entirety of the immigration system. Family reunification, a move towards more of a merit-based, it, it brings in a whole series of other questions. Um, it's hard for me to imagine, given the challenges that this administration is going to face broadly on the economy and public health, and its very narrow political base, uh, that it can undertake something as ambitious as a major immigration reform um, in the first two or three years of its administration. And where is your take on the, um, Roberto, your take on the, um, on the international standards that um, Eric alluded to? And where, where um, yes, you, you alluded to the fact that there are, that there are very, you know, you, that they are in, internal or um, domestic aspects that you have to focus on. Um, there, is, there is the questions about uh, the utility of international standards. Do we need them? Um, will they be a priority or not? Um, would, we, uh, would the Biden administration rather focus on other aspects? Um, where, where do we go there? Um, and um, it would be great to hear the perspectives of all the three of you. Yeah. Well, I'll start with a little bit of a contrarian view as is my usual role in these conversations. But so the United States and Europe as well 
um, is facing a very, what I believe is a very fundamental challenge in uh, establishing standards for the admissions of asylum seekers, people who arrive at the country, arrive at our borders and say, let me in based on my experiences of some kind of, of persecution or, or ill effects, something that has happened to me that makes me worthy of admission. And deciding what the standards are on, on that basis, what you have to have experienced as an individual that justifies the grant of entry um, is something that Germany, the United States, and all the industrial democracies are struggling with and will, and will struggle with even more because, as I was saying before, the drivers that are pushing people towards the democracies in this kind of migration, where people arrive at the border saying, let me in because of what's happened to me, is increasing. So what are the standards? Where do you draw the line? And the United States has struggled with this. It's a political issue. Uh, Germany has struggled with this. It's a juridical issue as well. And it's very undecided. Um, and one question is, are we, these individual rich democracies, better off trying to figure these things out for themselves? Or is it better to try and come up with a universal standard that everybody agrees on that will be applied universally? Um, I'm of the view that the, a politically lasting solution has to be a national solution. Um, and that has to, and that the standards have to conform to the challenges of specific geographies in specific places. And here, you know, they're, they're, uh, the countries of Europe and the United States all have uh, face different challenges in the kinds of people that arrive and how they arrive and what the countries of transit are. So you end up with quite, you know, sort of fairly complicated judgments that have to be made that involve relationships with peripheral countries, as Germany is concerned with, uh, with Greece, Italy, and Spain in particular, and the United States is concerned with Mexico, and then relations with the sending countries. And then finally, what, under what circumstances, what, what has to have happened to you to merit entry? Um, and, and is that the right way to do it? Or should we look, be looking at these things entirely different, particularly in an era of climate change and other big, big drivers? Um, do we look at nations instead of people? We think of this in terms of, you know, uh, Europe's relationship to the Sahel or the United States relationship to Central America, as opposed to each one of you individually, we're gonna have to come up with a judgment uh, based on your individual facts. Um, this I think is gonna be the, the, the great, the great policy challenge in the next decade um, is, is how we make these judgments as countries of destination about who we let in, uh, under what circumstances and why. Um, and does a regime that is based on individual fact-finding about persecution really function in this world? Um. I, I'm going to say a few words about this. I'm certain that Alex will have something to say about this as well, since that's what the Ark of Protection, the book that you mentioned, is is all about. Um, uh, but I'll let the you know the real authority speak after uh, you know at the end. Um, um, you know, first I think it's important to say that none of these, none of the problems, concept, none of the challenges conceptually that Roberto Soro was talking about. Um, emerge in the Trump administration, right? Because conceptually, you know, it is a state-centered approach in which, um, you know, it, it, we, don't, we don't have to, nor is it very good for us uh, to be accepting uh, uh, migrants under any circumstances, refugees or otherwise. So this challenge um, really emerges uh, in the context of, of, of liberal democracies that believe in some, on some level, that migration can be a positive force, that even you know that um, um, you know, and that our val not only our not only our interests to some extent, but are also also our values uh, require that there be you know that that, that 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 we retain some fidelity to the principles behind the Refugee Convention and Protocol, however narrow those principles 
those principles may be. And this may be a good time for me to mention the Global Compact uh, on Migration, uh, Barrett, which we discussed you know, before this event, which in a certain way is a, is a pretty good symbol of, of this challenge because this is a document, it's not a binding document, but it's a document that the overwhelming majority of countries of the world signed on to. Um, and it's, it is a state-centered um, uh, approach. Uh, it recognizes state so sovereignty. Um, it talks about diminishing incentives for people to flee. Um, um, but it also recognizes that migration is inevitable. Uh, and can be and, and can be a positive force in global development. Uh, it's a rights-based document. Uh, it talks about um, uh, ensuring that individuals who do migrate um, uh, have uh, their rights respected. Um, it, it talks about implementing alternative pathways for migration, getting to the point that Roberto alluded to, the fact that maybe we need to have pathways for migration for people who may be forced to move, but may not meet the very narrow definition of what it is to be a refugee. Um, you know, it urges against uh, detention of migrants. It focuses on inclusion of migrants. Um, it, uh, it even identifies climate displacement as a critical issue and even suggests that governments should be thinking about ways to provide reception facilities for, for those who are displaced by disasters that are exacerbated by the impacts of climate change. So it's sort of conceptually, you know, inches in the direction, I think that to which Roberto is alluding, and certainly I think to which um, uh, Alex uh, uh, alludes, more than alludes in, in, his, in his book, The Ark of Protection. The challenge is while governments can agree to these notions conceptually, um, the devil is in the details and, and how to implement these objectives in practice. So in my engagement, in, all, in Refugees International engagement with the new administration, you know, our points are gonna be turn these concepts into realities. Try to think about how we can do that with respect to Central America, for example. You know, everyone agrees in principle that we need to expand the U.S. Ref not everybody, but many people agree in principle that we need to expand the U.S. refugee admissions program uh, so we can get more uh, people to come from Central America, you know, in an orderly way rather than having to go on dangerous trips uh, to to the southern border. But unless you make the refugee definition more relaxed. You could, you could have a refugee program for Central Americans and you won't have any very many Central Americans who meet the test. So there's gonna have to be you know, some consideration of what kinds of standards we're gonna use if we're gonna, if we're gonna say Central Americans need alternative paths for flight that give them the option of not having to go to our southern borders. And I think this administration is gonna be, the new administration is gonna be tested on all of these issues. And it's, it's, it's gonna be a challenge uh, for sure. Great, I, I can be very, very brief on this. Just to say, I actually wanna put the asylum question in perspective. Um, it's very important for Germany. It's been very important for Europe for years. It's been important that the Southwest border of the United States. And as Eric rightly said, and I'm sorry, I cut out for a few minutes and missed the beginning of, I missed the end of my answer and I missed the beginning of Eric's. But I think he's right that these, uh, these small events can seem like crises when they're very small numbers. Um, but two things on these. First of all, the solution to the global um, refugee system uh, crisis is not about changing standards in, um, in Northern states because most refugees are in the South and you have to take care of people better and create new refugee resettlement programs, other pathways for people to move. Uh, and the like. So the asylum question is a very narrow question, even though it occupies great attention in Germany and to some extent in the United States. But even in the United States, it's a small issue, except politically, as Eric mentioned, because a million people a year get green cards in the United States. Maybe 20,000, 30,000 are granted asylum, and maybe another 50,000 come in by refugee numbers. So in terms of the overall uh, immigration issue in the United States, 
asylum and refugees are very important to Eric and me because of the work we've done in the area. But in terms of the overall immigration story, we shouldn't blow it out of impo it, 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 in, in, in terms of its, its importance. And as I say, the real solution at the global level is the creation of a global responsibility sharing system that all nations share in and moving towards the issues that Eric talks about and thinking about climate change, what that'll mean for movement of people um, and the tinkering of the, of the standards uh, in US courts in the end up being really not very important to the overall story. Thank you, Alex. That's, that's a perfect, um, a perfect answer for the for the uh, actually leading into the next question. Um, global standards and and agreeing on something globally. We just got a question uh, in here about uh, Europe and the critical um, and the critical um, opinions vis-a-vis -vis immigration. Um, the question says just too many people wanting to come both of reasons for security and seeking a better life in Europe. Um, you just alluded to the fact, yes, we have to work together and so on. Um, here, the question is, is the Biden administration likely to be even more open to immigration than is Europe in the future? And how, if this is the case, how then will you work together? Um, in short, so Europe closes down while the US opens up, question mark. Well, I, I don't know what the US opening up means. I mean, we have immigration laws that permit the immigration of hundreds of thousands of people every year. That's set by, by, by statute. And people, the opening up may be that will be more uh, open to asylum seekers at the Southwest uh, border. Um, but um, yeah, so I, I don't, I see an apples and oranges in the question there, but I'd like to push this over to Roberto if I can, because I think he's thought much more about the European situation. Well, I mean, where there's a commonality is in this phenomena of, um, of asylum seekers, this, con this contemporary form of migration uh, of people who we know arrive with mixed motives, um, who may have humanitarian motives, but they also have economic motives and increasingly family unification motives. Uh, they're, they're following on now well-established migration pathways um, and in the United States, it's a very clear, distinct phenomena from certain less specific countries. Um, and though the numbers are seemingly small, they've added up. I mean, you know, the United States was, we had over 100,000 asylum seekers a month arriving in the United States steadily through large parts of 2018, 2019. Um, and the way the United, States has, the United States has dealt with them, both under the Obama administration and in, during the Trump administration, uh, was either to put them into sort of a, a, a nebulous status similar to what's happened in Germany with the large numbers of people who are tolerated, that are in limbo. They haven't formally been fully admitted, but they're not subject to removal. And we put people in a limbo state. There are now almost a million people um, who've made uh, asylum applications that are in this backlog. They could go for two or three or four years before their cases are decided. It's not clear on what basis they'll, they'll be decided. This phenomenon of, of large numbers of people arriving suddenly at borders asking for entry as asylum seekers has proved to be to have an outsized political impact, both in Europe and the United States, you just have to look at the experience of the middle of the last decade. Um, you know, everything we're talking about now, the Trump phenomena, to a certain extent, you go back into 2014, 2015, years that were very important in the politics of Europe and the United States. And the similarity there is that large, sudden, flows of asylum seekers prompted a move to the right that all of these democracies are still processing. And, um, and I think the potential for that kind of political reaction remains. So the question is, how do you manage this phenomenon? Because it's not going away. We know it hasn't gone away in the Mediterranean and it hasn't gone away on the Rio Grande. Um, and it, small numbers can produce large political responses. Um, it, and I don't think that's gonna change. 
Um, can, I just, can I disagree with that? I'm sorry, just for 10 seconds, Eric, just on sure, sure. Roberto, Roberto and I like fighting about this stuff. I think the, 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 the Trump, Trump comes out of not the asylum crisis, but the uh, entry of Mexicans into the United States for, for decades. And, and it's, it's a holdover for a time of very large Mexican migration. The spread of Mexican immigrants around the United States, concerns about Spanish, concerns about demography, concerns about race, I think are much more salient actually than the asylum seekers here. Um, I was going to make two points. Um, uh, first, um, that I think Alex made the point earlier that um, that we don't want to overestimate these changes uh, in a certain way because immigration level, levels are set by statute, etc. I think we also got to be careful not to underestimate um, uh, uh, the impact of, of, of the new administration on immigration generally. Because yeah, I mean, there is there are statutes. But first of all, I think we are learning and we're going to learn more about how this White House, the current White House, was successful, especially in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. But, but, but I believe that effort in the context of the COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic was in many respects a pretext, a pretext for policy measures that the White House and uh, Stephen Miller in particular, uh, a senior advisor to President Trump in the White House, had in his sights all along. So the, the White House has been successful over the past many months in dramatically reducing legal immigration. Um, and, um, and, the, and, and a Biden administration is committed uh, to legalization of, of many millions of undocumented uh, immigrants. I wouldn't underestimate uh, the importance of the, the increase in refugee admissions that we're gonna see in the Biden administration. So I do think there's gonna be not only the perception of a change, but some significant and substantial changes which will have impact in terms of numbers. That's, that's my first point. My second point is, I think, I'm now gonna comment on Roberto's comments. I think, um, the, a key issue that arises from Roberto's comments, both in Europe and in the United States, what are we going to do about the externalization of, of, of consideration of claims for protection? What we see in the European context, what we saw uh, with, the, with, 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 with President Trump is, you know, you have an asylum seeker who comes, you don't say, necessarily we're going to forcibly return you to your country of origin, but we're, we're not going to take care of your situation on our territory. We're going to do it outside our territory or we're, and, and in, in a variety of ways. And for the advocacy community, you know, this has been a major source of concern. And, and, um, and Roberto's comments, I think, really are, you know, are, are really connected to that phenomenon. And I think it's going to be a real test uh, for the Biden administration, and it's going to play out in the first instance with respect to the asylum seeker population that is now in northern Mexico, uh, and and how they're going to deal with uh, that situation. Thank you. We covered quite a lot here, um, and very different forms of migration. Um, and very different forms of um, political approaches. And this is why I like uh, the following question from one of uh, the closest friends of the American Academy here and um, really long-term friends. And they uh, actually asked, um, you, you mentioned a broad political bandwidth. What on earth will the Biden administration do first? Well, I mean, I'll, I mean, you know, we can speculate, I think, the there's very substantial internal pressure uh, inside the Democratic Party um, to first address the question of uh, the the dreamers, the childhood arrivals. This is this program that uh, Obama started by executive action um, to basically protect young people who arrived here as children out out of status to protect them from deportation um, and to give them the right to work and study legally in the country. Uh, Trump attempted to reverse that uh, program. It's being fought out in the courts. 
but there's going to be very substantial political pressure to move very quickly um, and and put that population it's quite small 700,000 people in the larger scheme of the country but to put them on a secure footing um, and just and to, and to clarify their status um, and and that itself has proved to be politically difficult I mean it, it that alone will require um, some capital and there's a question of whether to do it by executive order or try and find some legislation um, but I, I mean I that would be my guess as to what the first step is going to be What about the others? I, I think that um, as a as a practical matter, um, I think uh, he will. Um, you know, I, I think if if I were the president elect, uh, my initial actions would be the ones that I think are you know sort of the easiest ones to achieve. Um, and so um, I would, uh, you know, I would take it. I would I would focus in you know in in many respects on issues uh, beyond the borders of the United. States, right? Well, I mentioned the, you know, uh, on migration. If we're talking about migration, um, you know, the uh, the global compact, the, the the on migration, the global compact on refugees, um, make clear that the administration's um, uh, initial request for uh, refugee and humanitarian assistance around the world is going to be far more robust than what you know what we've seen in the last four years. Um, you know, uh, um, I think I think that he's going to have to make some very early decisions on legal positions surrounding uh, the Trump administration's um, uh, initiatives uh, surrounding the border, and that I think is going to be a real a real challenge for uh, the new administration. But they're going to have to make some decisions about you know the positions of the administration with respect, for example, to the migrant. The so-called migrant protection protocols, the return to Mexico policy, which relies on a on a pretty obscure uh, um, a piece of legislation, which the administration, in our view, has um, uh, misapplied in justifying return to Mexico of asylum seekers, um, uh, not even uh, uh, or expulsion to Mexico, essentially of asylum seekers, where they need to wait for their claims to be adjudicated. So there are cases like that. Where the administration is going to have to make some early decisions, um, and that are going to be difficult, I think. Um, so, I think I answered this question in my first answer, but I got did, did that come through? Because I got cut off in the middle. I'm not sure how much of that is actually answered, buried or not. Uh, parts of it were answered, but um, you, okay, you well, me, two, sen okay. two sentences. <laughs> Sorry. Two sentences from you, Alex. <laughs> right now, okay. So I want to I want to say something entirely sort of contrary to this. Is that what Biden? There's a lot Biden could do. I think he should do it quietly, actually, because a lot of this is tricky. And I think that what he actually should be focusing on are other policies that get rid of the anxiety about immigration, which are economic policies that help all Americans. If you can reduce anxiety in the US, you'll find people more open to immigration policies later, rather than saying, I'm going to do these big things on immigration, I'm going to make a lot of noise about these things. And how do we reduce anxiety? How do we do that? <laughs> well, no, I mean, the question is, do you try to roll over the 73 million Trump voters and say, we don't care, we won, we're going to push all this stuff? Or actually, we're going to try to appeal to some people who used to be Democratic voters by building hospitals in rural areas and by doing infrastructure programs that employ people that are not race-based but appeal to everybody. So a very broad economic agenda appealing to people who feel disenfranchised currently in the United States may be one strategy. That indirectly, I think, is going to loosen up attitudes on immigration much more than saying immigrants are good for the United States. You guys don't recognize that. I, um, I, I, I don't disagree with what Alex is saying. I think, I think the more, the better, you know, uh, uh, the, the more secure people feel about their economic well-being, their public health, um, I think the more, the better it is for, um, uh, for refugees and immigrants. No question about that. But I also would not you know, diminish the importance of um, of, um, of of political messaging, messaging of, of of efforts to you know to really help to to transform 
narratives, public narratives about, about refugees, about the other. I mean, if we're not, if this administration is not committed in some way, shape, manner, or form, but in a sophisticated way uh, for, uh, to that kind of strategic messaging, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna forego a really critical tool in helping to, you know, to, to, to inform public perceptions on this issue. Well, but, and that's and that has not traditionally, let me say, that has not traditionally been a major objective of government uh, on these issues, and I think it needs to be. Well, that's why I've said I think the most important thing Biden could do is a set of speeches early on. I'm just saying about specific actions. Right. I think you're, the way you're going to change minds is not by giving them data. It's going to be by changing their economic situations. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll offer my two cents very briefly, which is, um, I mean, my view is of a country that is profoundly divided and antagonistic and, and not just divided in two, but divided into multiple camps. And the Democratic Party is, is divided into two camps, a centrist and a leftist camp that are increasingly hostile to each other. And immigration is at the center of a lot of these fights. Um, and remedying, I mean, you can, you can, you can imagine some future in which somehow there's healing. Um, it's easier to imagine a future where this election was just sort of the end of act one uh, in a conflict that's got another decade to play out. Well, you see a severe you've seen, violent political drama that's got a decade to play out. Yeah. You know, I think these perspectives, I, I don't disagree with, with him, with, with, with Roberto, but, but I think you're also seeing the distinction between, um, you know, I've spent most of my, my career and I think uh, Alex has spent much of his career um, in, in the field of, you know, advocacy, um, you know, both within the government and outside the government. So you're getting an advocate's, uh, for me, certainly uh, an advocate's perspective. I think from Roberto, you're getting an analyst's perspective. And, um, you know, I, 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 can't, I can't disagree with what Roberto is saying, but I think there are ways to push against these realities uh, to try to get to a better place uh, for everybody. Thank you. These are perfect last words. Time is up. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Roberto. And thank you, Alexander. This, um, this was excellent. Thank you for a very lively discussion. Um, I would like to invite everyone uh, to the next uh, event um, of the series, which is uh, pretty simple. Why trade matters on December 9. Um, thank you. And um, as I said before, all the three of you are, of course, warmly invited to come to Berlin as soon as possible. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.